This is the SF Productions Podcast Network. Hi, Cube. Do you, Cube? From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. You can check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife to Read Comics, on iTunes or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. So with 500 channels on cable boxes today, it's hard to remember when cable or where it actually began. It was a way for people with poor TV reception to get their local stations if they lived in valleys or things like that. Right. They, they would literally put an antenna up on the tallest peak and run a cable down to you. Yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that was a decent market for the early days of cable, but there was a need to advance. And how do you do that when the 500 channels don't even exist yet? Yeah. You, you know, you can't really, <laughs> you know, provide channels for a market that doesn't exist yet. Right. So. You have to create that market. Mm-hmm. So in 1977, Warner Cable, now Time Warner, mm-hmm. created an interactive cable system called Cube. And that's Q-U-B-E. Q-U-B-E. Yes. Premiered in Columbus, Ohio. And this was... In an era when it was your biggest technology was 110 baud modems, not yes. even 300 baud. Mm-hmm. I mean, this was early, early days of the of the of home computers. Mm-hmm. So there were multiple components involved with Cube. There was a remote. It was big. It was clunky. And did I mention it was wired? Yes, it's not even a wireless remote. <laughs> it's a wired remote. It had a lot of these big physical buttons on it. Mm -hmm. There were three sets of 10 channels each on this system. There were 10 pay-per-view channels. So this is early, early Mm pay-per-view. There were movies, there were sports, there were events, and there was also a porn channel. Of course there was, because because porn drives new technology. Yes! (laughs) There were 10 local and regional channels, just broadcast uh, channels, Remember, there are no cable channels at this point that exist. Mm -hmm. And then there were 10 interactive channels, which we'll get to in a bit, along with response buttons and buttons to pick which of the three channel sets to use. So you had to go, I want this one, hit this button, and then hit this thing. Yes. As channels changed, Warner would send you a new paper insert that you would stick stick into the thing. So it plugged into this big brown metal box about the size of a desktop PC that had two cable runs going back to Warner Cable. That so, was your cable box at the time. Yes. <laughs> and this is what you needed for two-way communication. So mm-hmm. one was up and one was down. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Warner built a local station in Columbus to create local interactive programming. and <laughs> It was over on Allen Creek Road. I actually... Uh, directed an episode of a, a public access uh, a, a show uh, in the same studio. Mm. At one point, I think All American Cable owned it. I, I, I don't know what it's being used for now. So here is some of the programming that was available on this. Talent Search with local performers. It was produced by Robert Morton, who later produced Letterman's NBC See, show. There you go. Celebration, a local talk show. Pinwheel, a kid's show, similar to Sesame Street, which went on to be the flagship show with which what became Nickelodeon. Hmm. This was the <laughs> the Petri dish of the cable industry. <laughs> Apparently, yeah. <laughs> Flippo's Magic Circus, where a local TV clown got an interactive show. Mm-hmm. A game show called How Do You Like Your Eggs? A game show hosted by Bill Cullen where contestants try to guess how the viewers answer questions. It was sort of like an early family feud type Except of thing. Except it was live. Yes. Because you would literally at your home with your with your huge remote go, I pick number three. Yes. And Scrambled. then they <laughs> and then they they tabulate it and then the, the people in the audience you know, the people there had to, to to figure it out. There was Screen Test, a game show about movies, and there was Bananas, a teenage variety show. And they even had live auctions. So, like, the things they do on PBS, except it'd be like, here's this old chair, and who wants to bid this much for it? 
<laughs> hit the button. Nope. And uh, once who goes who goes one sixty five. But then, how would you pay for that? Well, it was all tied into your cable oh, account. Oh, so like they they would know that you bid on the old chair right. and bill you on your cable bill. Essentially. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so this was Amazon twenty years before Amazon existed. <laughs> Remember, no internet. Internet was DARPAnet at this point yes. and only being used by education at best yes. for email. Mm -hmm. And so for all these shows, you could vote via your remote on various questions. They'd like they'd stop everything and go, should we go to this thing or should we do this now? <laughs> oh, I wonder how many people were actually voting. Um, or, you know. I've I've seen some stuff on uh, online that actually showed day one, and there was like a few hundred people voting. Yeah. Cube eventually spread to other markets. Houston, Milwaukee, Dallas, Cincinnati, St. Louis, and Pittsburgh. I do not remember it, you know, growing up in the Milwaukee area. But I, maybe I'll ask my dad about it because, you know, maybe he did do it. I don't yeah. know. So Cube lost money from day one. <laughs> The infrastructure was incredibly expensive because you had to run two cable runs out to the house. These big, huge cable boxes. Mm -hmm. uh, the equipment was very finicky. They had to keep coming out, apparently, and constantly tweaking it to get it to work at all. The programming, although it was very primitive, cost money as well. Mm -hmm. So American Express bought out Warner Cable in the early 1980s. And Cube was phased out at that point. Warner Cable continued using the equipment for years to amortize it. So even though you weren't using the voting aspect or anything, they still used it as a cable box. Right. When I moved to Columbus in 1987, this was five years after they essentially shut it down. When I first got cable, I had the big brown box behind the TV. Mm -hmm. That's why I know about it. They had already moved on past the wired remote at least, but mm -hmm. I knew people in town who still had the huge wired remotes. <laughs> <laughs> So, it, you know, it was a success or a failure. What was it? Well, Warner used Cube to get local cable contracts around the country, turning them into a major player. Mm -hmm. And that's why Time Warner is so huge right now, because they were like, we have interactive cable. Do you want this in your market? Mm -hmm. And they got into all these markets because of it. Cube alumni went on to create or produce MTV, ESPN, QVC, Nickelodeon, The Jerry Springer Show, and Letterman. <laughs> so, again, this, this Petri dish of the industry, they did all these shows that ended up becoming cable channels. Uh-huh. Well, that's interesting. And, you know, to think it all started from this stupid thing. Yeah. <laughs> now, you can see some Cube programming on YouTube. And I also want to thank cube-tv.com for some of the photos that I've been putting up throughout this this video. Um, and, by the way, you can actually see day one of Cube, which is fascinating because it's Flippo the Clown flying in in a helicopter and a marching band uh, serenades him into the studio. <laughs> this is all happening over on the east side of Columbus. And this would have all had to have been live TV. Oh, absolutely. Oh, it's all live. It had to be. It was interactive. It had to be. Huh. <laughs> I don't think they could have kept that up for very long. No. 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 <laughs> I'm glad we don't have to do things live. We well, yeah. We record everything. And you yeah. can check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife to Read Comics on iTunes, or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Indy. I'm Mark. Thanks for watching. And enjoy Cube!